Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to call this meeting of the TRPA Legal Committee to order. The date is Wednesday, September 27th, 2023, and the time is 8.30 a.m. First item on the agenda is the roll call to determine a quorum. Catherine? Ms. Faustinos? Here. Ms. Gustafson? Here. Ms. Aldine? Here. Ms. Williamson? Mr. Rice? Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, for the members of the public who are joining us remotely to observe the meeting, go to trpa.gov under the calendar header, click on Governing Board Hybrid Meeting for September 27th, 2023. There you will find a link to the public meeting hosted on Zoom. To address the committee members directly with your comments, raise your hand in Zoom by clicking raise hand at the bottom of your screen at the appropriate agenda item. With your hand raised, you will be unmuted by TRPA staff and have three minutes to address the committee. If you have used the dial-in numbers to join us by telephone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand and be unmuted. For items that are agenda items as informational only, we will hear public comment during the general public comment period at the end of the meeting. Comments on the items agendized for action or possible action, uh, we will hear public comment before the board takes any action. Members of the public participating via Zoom, identifying themselves with an obscene, slanderous, or offensive name will not be called on to make public comment. To remote committee members, and that would be Belinda. Good morning, Belinda. Uh, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand in Zoom. You will find the hand icon on the bottom of the screen. Remote committee members may not use the chat box to make any comments or to have sidebar conversations. Please, everyone, remember to mute your mic until speaking to cut down on background noise. Finally, I would also like to ask uh, remote members to turn on their cameras, and uh, obviously Belinda's camera is on, and I gather Wes is not going to be joining us today. Okay. Uh, members of the public who have joined us in person, please raise your hand at the appropriate time for public comment, and you will be called on to, um, well, we have, we don't have anyone in the audience, so we can dispense with that uh, admonition. Committee members who are in person, please raise your hand if you wish to comment and speak clearly into the microphone in front of you. We have no microphone because we're in a conference room, so just speak loudly and you'll be heard. The next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Um, John, any changes to the agenda? Yes, we don't. We do not need uh, item number four, closed session, item number five, information. So we can dispense with those. Dispense with those. All right. Then we'll deem the agenda approved as modified. Approval of minutes. Uh, we are now on agenda item number two. Uh, we have a draft set of minutes from July 26, 2023, on page seven of your packets. Does any member of the committee wish to make any change? All right, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes as presented? So moved. We have a motion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Belinda? <laughs> aye. <laughs> okay, but Belinda is raising her thumb. Okay. Yes. <laughs> saying aye. All right, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is agenda item number three, which is the appeal of denial of a single use peer expansion application to uh, application. The address is 204 Pine Street in Placer County, California. Assessor's parcel number APN 098-210-012, TRPA file number ERSP 2020-0373, appeal number admin 2023-0013. Information on this item can be found on page 222, oh, I'm sorry, 229 of your packets. As a reminder of the public, after board discussion on this item, you may raise your hand in person. Uh, we have no people joining us in person here in the room other than the applicant's representative. Um, and be called on uh, in Zoom to be unmuted by TRP staff to share your comments. John, would you like to uh, present staff's? Um, Presentation. Yes. Excuse me. So this is an appeal of a denial. So it comes to you in the position of an application. Um, when the application is denied by the uh, executive director uh, or for delegate, I think we're in this case. Um, and uh, we can go to the next slide. So this is just a general area slide. Uh, you'll see the uh, yellow uh, pin is the site, and um, one more, please. And um, this is the best 
uh, aerial, but uh, the pin again is the yellow pin and the dark, darker reddish uh, pier in front of that house is the pier we'll be talking about. Um, Greg has some better pictures in his presentation, so uh, we can also uh, uh, look forward to those. Next slide, please. So what the uh, applicant uh, desires is to take down the existing rock crib pier and uh, entirely and uh, replace it with a uh, newly constructed uh, piling pier, single pile pier. Um, and the question that we really are facing today is what can you do with a non-conforming structure? And um, staff viewed this uh, proposal as an expansion of a non-conforming structure, and the code denies the ability to expand a non-conforming structure unless you bring it into conformance. Um, and it is a uh, expansion under the definition, if we can go one more slide, uh, which means this is a chapter 90 definition. Um, uh, it essentially says an increase in its size or extent, including an increase in the dimensions of a structure in addition of any structure or edifice to an existing structure. So let's go back one, please. Um, and while it's a little difficult to see on this slide, what they are asking for are, is 15 feet of additional length. So that's one, that's an expansion. Uh, it's an increase in dimension. They're asking, uh, and the 15 feet of additional length uh, extends the 16-foot uh, pier head also. Um, they're asking uh, for an extension of the, I believe it's the southern, or in this diagram, the bottom catwalk. Uh, they have two catwalks. They want to expand the bottom catwalk. Um, and they want to add a boat lift. Uh, and that's also an expansion of the existing structure. So from staff's perspective, this is relatively straightforward. It presents interesting issues because uh, they are willing to take down an entire rock group pier. And um, there are benefits uh, associated with that uh, to the environment, both scenic and probably littoral drift processes to some extent, um, although it's been in the lake for a long time. Um, and so that's really as far as TRPA staff got when essentially they would not uh, modify the, the newly built here to bring it into conformance. Um, TRPA issued a letter of denial uh, for the application, so it didn't get very far in the application process by the time that was issued. Um, the applicant does have uh, multiple different uh, avenues to pursue here if they want to maintain the pier. They want to enlarge it uh, or expand it with the boat lift, the cat, the extension of the catwalk and the extension of the pier head uh, into the lake. They need to bring it into conformance and all that would require would be to bring the pier head from 16 feet to 10 feet um, and to uh, reduce, uh, have only one catwalk. Uh, and I think that's it. Mm -hmm. So if they do that, then they can get their, uh, apply for their extra 15 feet if the findings can be made uh, of length. And um, they are willing to trade in a buoy for a boat lift. Uh, and if it complies with the sign standards, they'd be able to put in the boat lift. So that's, pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Greg, unless you have questions. And, and any questions by members of the committee at this point? Um, and Greg, you'll have 15 minutes to make your presentation. Um, <clears throat> since it's the only item on the agenda, I'm hoping we can have a little bit more. <laughs> well, let's- anticipate running a little bit over, so. Okay, uh, all right. It, it no worries, you bet. All right, <clears throat> so slide one from our side. Here's the uh, current Thompson family pier. You'll notice, uh, for those of you who are, I think everybody here is pretty familiar with these structures. Uh, uh, rock curve structures are huge, massive. You can see how 
biggest is the first three piling, pilings. You can notice we have a solid wall, and then after that, it's uh, uh, traditional rock crib uh, construction. Normal piers are in the background, the open piling ones. Um, obviously, much less scenic impact. Um, I can agree in part with John's introduction, and of course, respectfully disagree with my colleague in other respects, but uh, um, basically, uh, this is a pier that's been there for a week, it's been 30 to 40. Um, there's never been a time, I guess I, I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Greg Lean, for the record. Uh, this is Abby uh, Edwards from uh, Lake Sapo Planning, you call it that. Sapo Land Planning. Sapo Land Planning, I said it right. Um, and uh, we are representing the uh, Thompson family. Um, uh, I've, I've been here, I moved here in 1971 <laughs> before there was even a traffic light on the entire North Shore, so I remember you know, these used to be a lot more common. Um, and I started practicing law here in 1980. So over these 43 years, I've been focusing on Issues having to do with shore zone. I was on the uh, shore zone ordinance committee uh, back in the 1980s when you did your very first one. Our committee subsequent, with the exception of the steering committee in this last round. Um, and uh, um, I certainly have been called upon to be an expert witness in this stuff from time to time. So I, I, I am telling you, I do not recall a time uh, when there were not incentives um, to get people to convert these type of heavily impactful structures to open piling because um, it's good for the environment. It, it's just, uh, uh, I think we can all agree this is something we'd like to see uh, go to open piling. Um, and this one too is one of the largest remaining rock crib structures uh, under private ownership on the entire lake that's not associated with a, a, a breakwater and slips and uh, or a marina or whatever. This, this is quite large. Um, in terms of process issues, uh, uh, John's mentioned that the staff has determined, uh, but what's missing here, I think, is uh, really a public policy look uh, at the issues. Um, where it's not a staff determination. I think we really need to look at this in the matter that uh, John brought up in his staff report uh, uh, earlier, the, um, the Gately matter. That was a very, very limited, for those of you that were there, very limited look at what do you do if you just want to trade out a, a buoy for a boat lift. And we want to do that here too. Um, but that was with no environmental pluses other than uh, what Jan Briscoe, I thought, argued uh, very well, that there is some benefit to the environment from going from uh, a buoy to a, a boat lift. But here we're offering you a, an entire suite of improvements that I want to get into a little bit. But again, from the best of my knowledge, the precedent has already been set over nearly half of its country now of trying to provide incentives to get these uh, structures to convert. Uh, this has never been discussed, hasn't been before the board, hasn't been before the steering committee in any kind of focused way. So purely a, a, a matter of a staff determination, if I'm accurate, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's true. Um, so the issue today, is, so as a policy point of view, there's a item on your uh, agenda later with an ordinance amendment. I think we should talk about that uh, too and how that might uh, affect what we're doing here today and how you might want to look at having a, a policy debate. I think it's been axiomatic in planning to really not only look at uh, getting uh, public input, but uh, uh, really reaching out and looking at the impact of these things carefully rather than just having, uh, and it's appropriate from time to time to have a uh, staff determination, but where um, they're controversial, apparently, like this one, I think we need a policy discussion. Um, and uh, just my own aside, it's really not the best idea to uh, do that in the context of the project, but here we are, so we need to at least look at this as an example. Hopefully, we will agree that uh, this is appropriate. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, so, I think John's essentially right about the scope. 
Um, we're converting, as you can see, the upper part is what we have now, lower part is what we're proposing. <laughs> the uh, pier width uh, decreases, the pier head width uh, goes from 10 feet to 16 feet. Um, uh, both catwalks go to adjustable, which means they can be brought down to uh, lake level, thereby reducing their scenic impact. Um, and then uh, installing uh, chairs and stairs uh, below the high water line for public uh, trust access. Um, the extension of the pier, by the way, uh, deserves a little bit of uh, consideration. I, you've probably seen this issue before, but there's a provision in the pier for an additional 15 feet. Uh, it's, it's almost uh, now become a right. Uh, the pier immediately to the north has just taken advantage of that uh, provision as well. Uh, you know, we're not asking for anything that uh, uh, is special here. This is really something granted to virtually everybody. Is, uh, I'm sure John would agree. Um, let's go to the next slide. So uh, I, th I think we're all familiar with rock crib, but for those of you that aren't, uh, basically what you're talking about is taking a jetty <laughs> and covering it with uh, wood and uh, steel and uh, um, uh, decking on top and whatever you need to make a pier out of it. So it not only... Uh, is desirable because of its, uh, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. These things are extremely uh, uh, bulletproof, um, but also provide, and this is one of the main benefits that my clients are willing to give up, it provides that breakwater effect. So in an area uh, like Tahoma, where the winds regularly clock back and forth in a late afternoon and you're coming back in in your boat, you want to come up on the lee side believe me, so you're not bashing your boat up against the bumpers and uh, uh, trying to unload the uh, grandma and grandpa on a, a major storm event or something like that in the afternoon. So these are very, very uh, desirable, add a lot of value uh, to the value of the real estate. Um, I, I also want to point out that um, uh, these things, uh, when they need repair, uh, that repair itself can uh, create much more disturbance than simply replacing piling or things that can be accessed uh, without opening up the crib. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So uh, because these structures are um, basically, again, jetties, uh, very, very reflective to wave action, um, they uh, interfere with something called littoral drift. Littoral drift is the tendency of particles to move along the shoreline. Uh, there are various segments along the shoreline. Maybe you've heard experts talk about this, where some cells move north-south, some move uh, the opposite direction. In this particular case, because of the prevailing northerly winds in this area, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, um, that you can see how there's more sediments, that area in light blue is degraded fish habitat. Uh, it's hard to see there in that diagram, but uh, um, the degraded fish habitat is on the lee side, the southern side uh, of the rock grid pier, because what happens is the fine materials get scoured from the windward side and they go around and then settle where the water is calmer on the leeward side. And uh, that covers up uh, spine gravels, um, you name it. Uh, it. It just becomes uh, an area where the fish, especially the forage fish on Lake Tahoe, uh, just uh, can't, uh, uh, can't uh, function. And forage fish are very, very important, as uh, many, many of you have heard the debates over the years uh, in feeding uh, the long cutthroat trout and others, which happen to like rock grid piers. But uh, um, anyway, the way things are, are mapped, uh, this is the way it goes. Uh, if you remove this structure, it completely restores the natural fish habitat. So in the staff report, you know, you talk about only the area under the here being improved, but as you can see, it's a major swath of area uh, that will be improved if this structure uh, is removed. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
So this is a, an aerial taken in 2013. Uh, at that time, I looked it up, the uh, water level was about at 6225. So you're just about two feet above low water. So the, even though you can't see a lot of the area that's uh, inundated there, and, and the, the, trust me, as in the previous slide, those uh, sediments are there covering up the fish habitat. And uh, uh, those will all be improved um, immediately upon uh, converting this to uh, rock crib, uh, from rock crib to open piling. Um, and one of the, a couple of things that you can notice here are where did the rocks come from for this rock crib? And going back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, before any regulation, they would go out and big heavy equipment when the water was low and they would just scrape the rocks off the bottom and pile them in a big pile. And that appears to be exactly what's happened here. You can notice that there's bare areas on both sides of the pier, uh, again, denuding a uh, uh, fish habitat. And it looks like an, there's an area immediately north along the beach where that was done before for reasons unknown. And then uh, in the southern side of the pier down toward the right, you can see the more normal uh, spread of rocks. Um, one thing we would propose to do if this project is approved is to get together with the staff and fisheries experts and look at how uh, we can begin to restore a much broader area with um, uh, with these rocks that have been removed from uh, the natural substrate and uh, put them back in something that's uh, really going to provide uh, a lot more than even maybe feed and escape cover. A tremendous benefit uh, uh, from that. Next slide, please. So scenic benefits. Uh, hopefully these speak for themselves. We won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, uh, we've gone over this with uh, our senior consultants and uh, uh, Brent Trams, who is one of PRPA's uh, senior mentors. The staff and I have talked to him, and, and he would point out and has been out to this site and looked at it. And um, uh, to him, it's just a, a complete no brainer. I mean, and, and the other uh, aspect of this, as you can see uh, in the first slide, you saw the piers to the south, they're all open filing. The piers to the north, you can see in the left photo, are also open piling. And what the eye does is it goes to the outlier. Uh, and, and what we're really looking at is if someone uh, is going in a boat, uh, meandering up the shore, looking at the houses. Uh, or whatever they're looking at, um, they are going to immediately see the outlier. The outlier is this ma you know, massive rock crib structure. Um, and if we go to open piling, you won't have that anymore. You're going to be seeing something again that looks much like the neighbors. You can't tell whether it's 16 feet wide, 12 feet wide, 10 feet wide. You know, you're just going to be seeing. Uh, open piling pier. Um, and uh, again, when you're uh, going along at, at the level of someone sitting in a boat, you're going to see underneath the pier, begin to see the beach underneath. Um, whereas before, uh, with the structure as it exists now, you're going to be seeing nothing except the pier. So you're going to be seeing a tremendous. Um, Scenic benefit, I hope that speaks for itself. Um, let's go to the next slide. Anyway, the pier sticks out like a sore thumb, as you can see, but um, even from this view. Uh, but I want to talk about water quality impacts because this is something I think that's under recognized. Uh, uh, again, they, uh, you can't see it very well, but the first. Um, third of the pier, let's say inshore, is also a solid rock wall, that's concrete. Um, and then you can see a wall along the shoreline. And typically we have, that's a tip off that uh, we've got potential shoreline erosion uh, as a problem in this area. Um, I, I'm sure you've got three presentations on this kind of thing before, but just to uh, take you uh, through a little bit of the history here. Uh, as long as we have time. Um, lake Tahoe is no longer a natural lake. 
uh, and that changed uh, abruptly uh, at the uh, conclusion that, uh, well, how are we doing it, Shelley? Well, you're, well, you're over 15 minutes, but go ahead. Okay. You could wrap yeah, up. Yeah, we've, we've got to just a few more slides. Okay. Um, but this is an important point. So uh, the top six plus feet of Lake Tahoe are now a reservoir. Um, and uh, that took place permanently in 1913 with the completion of the, the, the dam in um, Tahoe City. And, and when the water is run up to high pool, as it was even before the permanent dam was, you, you see wholesale erosion of, of the shoreline. And the shoreline is still not adjusted to this reservoir level. So when we have uh, water up at, at extremely high pool, uh, we have uh, the potential for um, a, a real problem. Uh, the Windrose data, I'm a private pilot, so perhaps Mr. Thompson is too, so we talked about this aspect, and I also talked about it with uh, Randy Morey, who is the foremost expert, uh, some of you may know, in, um, in uh, uh, littoral drift and what happens in these kinds of things. And I'll just tell you what happens. Uh, New Year's flood was one example, um, if you remember that event, which was huge. Um, so the water actually went up above 6229.1 because we had a major uh, rain on snow event. Um, and the federal water master, um, believe it or not, uh, there's nothing in the TRPA code that allows TRPA to regulate water level. It's right in the TRPA compact that you can't affect the water level. You can't keep the water level down. It's going to stay up. Um, you know, I participated in the trailer talks and uh, got a provision in to at least let the water member, uh, water master think about water levels, but there's no uh, mandate other than they want to keep the water levels high. This picture is taken, as you can see, it's just a little below uh, uh, 28. Um, when the water goes up again to high pool and we get uh, winds which are from the prevailing direction uh, at South Tahoe Airport, uh, the, the runways are 1836, which means it's, you know, directly north-south. This picture is taken from the north, exactly the direction the wind's going to be blowing from. It's going to be blowing waves that, uh, you know, anybody's computer generation, it's just a matter of uh, what they call um, the fetch, the, the, it's just the mathematical calculation. Uh, and the, the waves uh, that you can model are going to be 10 feet plus uh, in a major, major storm event. So that's going to be going straight into that corner. That's going to essentially scour the base of that wall. And before you know it, uh, and I've seen this happen uh, tens of times, uh, Randy Morey's seen it hundreds of times, so, where you're going to be having a virgin shoreline um, with all the nutrient-rich soil going directly into Lake Tahoe. And uh, this is something that you don't want to have happen. Uh, so that's kind of a nightmare scenario, I know. But um, it happens. I've seen it happen uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, I want to turn it over to Abby and have her take the next slide on uh, what we've done uh, in reliance on uh, our understanding of the rules. Uh, I believe. One really important aspect of this appeal is that prior to design and submittal of the application, we met uh, the applicant, Paul Thompson, property owner, Paul Thompson and Kaufman Edwards Planning, which is now Tahoe Land Planning, met with TRPA to go over the project scope. Um, we were aware that it was a non-conforming pier. However, because the, the potential benefits were so huge, we sat down with TRPA staff. Um, TRPA staff gave us the okay to proceed and uh, we were under the impression that this project could be approved based on the significant uh, improvements for scenic, fish habitat, littoral drift, um, everything that Greg has discussed. So um, we we're in, you know, from December, so we submitted or we met with TRPA on December 15th or December 5th. 2019. Um, after that meeting, we started our design. So from December 2019 to August 2020, 
We worked with an engineer on the design and submitted applications to TRPA, Fish and Wildlife, all the other agencies. Um, and it wasn't until almost a year later that on November 4th, 2020, that TRPA contacted um, my office to say the project could not be approved. Um, and that was at the point where we were all oh, already supposed to have our, our hearing notices mailed out. So that was almost a year later. Um, as you can imagine, that's, that's a lot of time. Um, we spent all the money on all the other agency applications. We actually got a permit from Fish and Wildlife in that time before November 2020. So we were very far along in the process um, before we were aware that this project could not be approved or notify that this project could not be approved. So obviously my client spent over $70,000. Now it's probably closer to 100,000 um, on design consulting and application and now attorney fees. So, um, you know, we feel, we feel we have a pretty good case um, as far as we did our due diligence. We met with TRPA before we submitted. Abby, I'm sorry to interrupt. It was any of this, um... Uh, memorialized in writing from TRPA staff? Um, have, strictly verbal? We have several emails from TRPA. It wasn't a formal pre-development meeting, but it was a meeting with Paul Thompson, myself, and Tiffany. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, does that conclude your presentation? Or? Uh, one final slide, I think. Okay. Um, I want to get to solutions and, and uh, yeah, let, let's get to a discussion. Um, uh, so, at the Gately hearing, uh, people were concerned about setting a precedent. Here, we're only suggesting a very, very narrow uh, modification to what you're going to review later. So here's the John's take on um, what the code amendment should be. You'll notice I've added a G under uh, the following are things that don't constitute this expansion. So I've added a G that wasn't one before. And it says conversion of a rock crib to open pile and pier, and notwithstanding the language below, including the conforming conversion of a buoy to a boat lift and minor conforming additional length. So that would cover this project, and then and, and, uh, you're not creating a precedent for anything other than removing um uh rock crib tears which is something you've been doing for for as long as i can remember and, and you should continue to do uh, um so uh and i think you could even further limit it if you were seriously concerned about precedent about this even uh to the point of saying oh i don't know we're just dealing with a pipeline project today because i do think there's a fundamental fairness issue because uh, literally we got up to the point of sending out notices to adjoining property owners of the upcoming municipal approval. Um, so, and, and it's been my experience too that you don't apply to all the agencies I've done consulting. Yeah, he's done it for a long time. You know, unless you feel really confident, you'll go to TRPA for you think there's a question and then go to the other agencies here. Felt totally confident going ahead. So, uh, Today, I, I think uh, let's discuss uh, whether there's a policy issue uh, that uh, if there is a, an inclination to go forward, how do you want to do that? And, and again, we'd like to engage in the discussion and uh, get your sense and answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for taking a look at the extra time and listening to us. No worries. Thank you. Tiffany, would you like to weigh in? You had some, some statements that were made regarding, you know, kind of the alleged misdirection given by TRPA staff, and if you can kind of summarize for us how this, in your estimation, how this process proceeded and, sure. and why TRPA took its ultimate, made its ultimate decision not to move forward with this application. Yeah, thanks, Shelly. Um, my name is Tiffany Good. I am the principal planner in the permitting compliance department, and I took the initial meeting with um, the applicant, and I was also the staff person who interviewed the subsequently submitted application. So, um, I think, you know, it's, it's, we as staff get requests all the time to weigh in on the potential feasibility of projects, um, you know, on an informal basis. And we, whether it's through in-person meetings or emails or phone calls, we get these requests all the time. And we, we try to be helpful, um, you know, but 
we also don't want to just say no to something. So we try to provide a, a path forward. And I think another important note, though, is that we never give conceptual approvals. Um, and that's not in our best interest, not in the applicant's best interest. The direction is you probably you might have a feasible project, um, but we won't know until you submit an application and we undergo a full project review and review the record. And so that that you know is a message that we try to convey in any conversation with the public. Um, and so I think that's important to note that this happens not just you know with Mr. Thompson and and, and Abby Edwards, but we get these requests all the time. Um, another important you know uh, I guess timing factor with this one is we were in the very beginning stages of implementing the shoreline plan. And one of the big changes with the, the new plan versus the old plan was how we treated um, non-conforming peers, particularly in regards to expansions and modifications. There was a big change, especially with how we apply um, an expansion of a non-conforming peer. So this, you know, during at the time of this preliminary conversation, this change was really being put to the test for the first time you know, one of the first times I would say. And so, I mean, for lack of a better term, staff hadn't really applied it that often. Um, so several months later, the application was submitted to TRPA. And then during that time frame, we had other applications submitted to TRPA that further tested this, this big change that we had in the code. And that further clarified exactly what you could do with a, a non-conforming peer. You know, there's a big difference between expansion and modification. And so as a result of all that had happened in the meantime um, and clear understanding of the application of the code, uh, I denied the application. And I think that sums it up. Well, it, it, when I first read the material, <clears throat> I didn't realize this was a complete teardown. I mean, this is not modifying or expanding the existing pair. This is a teardown and a rebuild, correct? Yeah. Um, so I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, you you were referencing in your presentation, uh, Greg, the the problems uh, with um, the rock crib pier interfering with littoral processes and and uh, kind of degrading fish habitat. Uh, has that uh, is that just kind of anecdotal, or do you have an analysis that was done by somebody who does these routinely to determine what the environmental impacts are of the existing pier? It's been a long time, so yeah. Um... Well, you and I go way back. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so you'll recall all the fish habitat basin at that yeah. time. Yeah, we did have a lot of experts looking not only at this site, but you know, lake wide and, and, and what does provide a benefit. So this is beyond question, I think, at this point, this provides a very, very significant benefit. To, and and so there's nothing site specific other than what you saw on that mm -hmm. map. This is the official maps from the experts that show the areas that are currently degraded. And uh, you can see why they're degraded. There's right. a one-to-one -one relationship between those sediments that have cover, covered the um, natural uh, um, beaten escape cover areas with the fine sediments. So those will go away when the rock cribs removed. So I think that's a real deal. If you'd like, we could get an outside expert to say that. Well, I, I would just, you know, I guess I'm, <clears throat> I, I've read all the definitions of modification and expansion and, and uh, you know they really, I generally in most cases apply to docks that are not being torn down, but docks that are being modified or expanded mm -hmm. in in C two right in place. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit different. And and my only concern, well, I have a number of concerns, but the concern about you know having modifying the language in the proposed amendments to our code uh, based on a project specific incident, you know, incident it just disturbs me, I mean, from a procedural standpoint. That doesn't mean that we can't make those modifications, but they would have to be more holistic. They wouldn't be project specific. And and I I don't know that we want to, I mean, obviously these code amendments are, are on the agenda for today for consideration. Um, and, and I think that removing rock cribs in general, converting rock cribs to open piling pier, I think would be advantageous but the rest of the language is really project specific about converting a buoy to a boat lift and minor conforming additional length. I mean, I don't know that that is appropriate 
you know, in this context. You, you, um, could, you could take that out, um, if, but then the question remains, um, what about the things that my client would need? So, yeah. you know, if we could, um, it, it, because we're just dealing with one project right now, I think you could make those findings under the existing language prior to adoption of this new code language, which would close the door to other people in the future. And I just question whether you want to do that. Well, but I, I but you could approve this today under the language of modification. And I didn't want to get into a big debate and show language. No, no, I understand. History, but, you know, and Jenny has her own perspective. I'm sure she'll talk about it in, in a minute. But I'm just trying to help us solve this <laughs> problem right now. Sure. With the least precedent. So if that language makes you uncomfortable, um, you could just take that out. Um, but as we sit here, you have the option to recommend to the governing board that they approve this project under the old language, under the theory that rock grip spears are a modification as opposed to an expansion and modification if you've gone through the language, you can see what we need to show. And we show all those things in space we need to show. We're not going any more non-conforming. We're not, we're going far more conforming. We have a substantial um, environmental benefit. I mean, tick through the findings that are all there. Uh, and and nothing could be more dramatic in terms of the improvements, but other than what you've seen today. This is very... John, did you have a comment? Well, I would just want to how about if I just do my five minute closing? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe absolutely. Jan okay. is on the edge of her seat to get the public comment. Go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. And, and then we can open it up for discussion. Okay. I, um, I did have a little addition to your, your question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't do a littoral drift study, but there were calculations prepared for the fish habitat resolution that would occur from the conversion, and it was. 1145 square feet of lake bottom disturbance, which is really important to Lahontan and um, other regions. Um, so we would be restoring 1145 square feet of lake bottom to open, which is, I think is a pretty big number. Um, and then as far as massing goes, um, we would bring be bringing the pier into conformance with massing. Right now the massing is 464 square feet. Um, you're allowed 220, and we would be removing 145 from the allowable massing, which is almost the massing of an additional pier. So it's pretty, it's pretty dramatic yeah. the improvements. So I just wanted to point that out. So Abby, you know, in uh, subparagraph C, it says modification does not increase the degree of nonconformance, but, but the degree of nonconformance is being expanded by extending a 16 foot wide deck. I mean, that, that is not consistent with our current code. So mm -hmm. while the first two, A and B, seem to be applicable, I'm not sure that the, you satisfy the requirements of the third. And that's my concern. And, and, and uh, I don't know if my client's on the line, but... Uh, I mean, yeah. yes. he's behind oh, you. Oh, there is. Oh, okay. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Men of bleachers. Men of bleachers. Would you like to... I didn't even realize you were here. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I, I mean, we've been dying to have a chance to have a meeting with the staff that's maybe you can see from our prior correspondent and talk about, you know, hey, can we reduce the, you know, we can reduce a little more. Uh, this is not okay. we don't necessarily need the, um, you know, all 16 feet. We can come a little narrower. We can reduce some things here and there, uh, wherever your concerns are. Um, and, and this is a project we want to get approved. I think we can work this out. Uh, Mr. Thompson, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, well, I think, you know, I'm not sure it's going to be uh, productive for me to rehash history. Um, you know, Tiffany is doing you know, a good job advocating the daughter. We thought we were working within the confines of a approvable project, but uh, obviously that was not true. Uh, that being said, um, you know, I want to, uh, you know, this is a big endeavor for us. We're trying to make it a win-win um, by removing the rock crib here, which is a massive structure. Um, and, you know, I would like to know, okay, does, are there certain elements of the pair design that are hot button for TRPA? Um, you know, we have an existing hammerhead now that's about 20 feet wide. 
Um, so we agreed to reduce it to 60 feet with the intention of being more in conformance. Um, and, you know, we have an added vote lift, but to me, it's like, um, we want to make this like, uh, you know, a, a collaboration where we have an approvable project. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and money and resources and um, I'm, I'm in the business, so I, I, I know the process and we want to see how we can advance the ball. Could you explain the collapsible catwalks? Are are they do they collapse against the superstructure when they're not in use? No. Uh, uh, well, it's my understanding that they just they are adjustable. Mm -hmm. Oh, in terms of they're height. not collapsible. Right. They they're not right. collapsable. So right now we have a catwalk that's underwater. <clears throat> and you have two catwalks underwater. Yeah. Um, is it necessary to have two catwalks if you have a boat? Um, you know, I uh, I spoke to. Uh, the boss, my wife, and she said uh, she can live with one catwalk if uh, that was a, a hot button. Um, and uh, we, but we do enjoy the hammerhead. Um, but we're, like I said, you know, we don't want to be trying to put a square peg in a round hole. So, so I wanted to clarify that what is the existing width of the dock, the, the dock leading up to the hammerhead? It's 11 feet going up. It's 11 feet, and okay, one foot off. Right. So we went down to 10, um, and uh, that was within the Within the code, right? Okay, so you remove the hammerhead, and then the entire pier would be a width of ten feet. Well, plus the extension we were proposing a, a a hammerhead, but we're reducing it from twenty to sixteen. Okay, is a hammerhead essential in your estimation? Um, I mean, essential is kind of a strong word. Yeah, I think that it's it's a, a source of enjoyment that we have out there now. Mm -hmm. We can stop there with the tables, and but it's not a, a essential. I mean. Mm -hmm. But that's why we thought we were compromising with Tiffany to make it 16 feet. Um, but like I said, we we, uh, we wanted this. Well, I guess my question, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Any other member of uh, the committee have any comments or questions? Belinda, we'll start with you. No? No questions. Okay. Uh, Cindy? I, I just had a question. I don't know who I should direct it to, to everybody, I guess. Um, so we, in uh, whatever paragraph where staff says there's multiple options here and here's what can be done. Um, I understand decreasing the pier head from the proposed 16 feet to what we now allow at 10 feet. Um, we retain one of the two proposed catwalks. Then it says decrease the proposed visible mass that counts for the allowable visible mass by approximately 19 square feet. Mm -hmm. Won't they have already met that by reducing the first two? I mean, is that a third criteria? Uh, I, th this is where I don't do your, so forgive me all of uh, being new I, to I the peer discussions. To that, mm -hmm. to, for the first step. Mm -hmm. um, initially, we had the massing of the proposed boat lift as I believe 147 something mm -hmm. square feet, but uh, in the past several months, there's been a clarification on the 2017 code. The boat lifts are now 83 square feet of massing, so that puts us in the conformance. So yeah, at the time yeah. that the application proposal came in, they were quantifying the boat lift at a at a greater square footage than what we call out in the um, in the EIS for analysis. And so that's kind of a further point of clarification that's that's come through as we've implemented the code. So mm -hmm. I think Abby, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe Abby's correct that um, if you implement that number of 83 square feet versus the 147, they would be in compliance with the scenic. Okay, so we're now just looking at the first two options mm -hmm. as potential from your estimation of how to approve this project or reverse this denial, mm -hmm. correct? Um, and then I look at it, you know, I definitely agree with the environmental benefit of removing the rock crib. I get that. But have we done that before? And this is the issue we face here is what are what is the what is the conformity with other projects? And so when we see a, an environmental benefit here, we can't. And for 40 years living up here, I've argued this is an environmental benefit to put a bike trail in a shore zone area but I didn't get trade-offs for it, right? Mm -hmm. So 
um, now in my professional career, now on the governing board, I'm looking at this going, okay, well, we, we have this benefit. And during the shore zone talks, which I thankfully wasn't part of, Jan, <laughs> you lived your life on them. Um, how could we weigh that? I mean, and we can't do it project by project. We have to do it through a policy or an ordinance that we could then apply to all others. Mm -hmm. And so that's, this is my concern is what precedent are we setting here by making a change in interpretation that we've used for others on the fly. So John, that's a question for you. <laughs> well, I think it leads, I can just do my- mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Kind of closing. okay that's that's right. Right. I think you're really talking about okay. it some of the underlying policy. Mm -hmm. um, and in the development of the uh, shoreline plan, mm -hmm. um, a lot of time was spent on what to do with non-conforming structures right. or really existing structures. Right. What can you do with an existing structure? So we have a chapter on existing structures. And a lot of negotiation went into um, you know, what kind of repairs you can do, how extensive you can uh, repair your non-conforming pier. And so really the balance was struck with, a, you know, I'm going to sketch this in very, very broadly, and Jan and, and Tiffany can, can correct me, but fundamentally you could keep what you have. In fact, for non-conforming piers, you can replace in kind what mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. So you can, that was, some, that was something new that was given to, to uh, lakefront owners uh, who have peers. Modifications um, essentially are you can modify if you can make these findings. Mm -hmm. And then expansions is where kind of the board said, all right, our strong interest is bringing peers into compliance with design standards. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're going to expand, if you want something, mm -hmm. Like if you want additional length, if you want additional boat lift, mm -hmm. if you want to expand, essentially you need to bring all the non-conforming uh, items into conformance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's basically <clears throat> the balance of what you can do with existing structures. And it depends on whether it's non-conforming or conforming. You can expand a conforming uh, structure up to the design standards. Mm -hmm. And so that's, if you look at those options, uh, in the staff report, mm -hmm. that's basically the policy that the governing board set into place when it adopted the shoreline plan. Right, right. So what we have here is we have an instance where we're getting, you know, a not insignificant degree of environmental improvement mm -hmm. offered, uh, but um, the the other the other kind of piece of that puzzle is. Um, you have to bring your peer into conformance. So that's part of that package of what you need to do to get those expansions, to get the boat lift, to get the additional length. Mm -hmm. So that's the that was the kind of the policy balance that the board struck at that time. And you know, while he didn't go into the language, Greg did basically, you know, that it, it's pretty clear this is an expansion. And Greg is asking if kind of that. <laughs> to squeeze it into a modification mm -hmm. so they can take advantage of those things. But right. I think the the precedential nature that we're talking about here is what is an expansion? Right. Because what's going to happen in the next one is, okay, how much of an environmental gain do you get right. for an expansion? How do we make that policy? These guys have weighted pretty heavily, but other people don't want to get rid of any of their non-conforming structures. So then it and what we tried to do in the 2018 plan was to get rid of the horse trading mm -hmm. to say, you know, uh, staff and the applicant negotiating back and forth as to, you know, how much environmental benefit is enough to get an expansion. Mm -hmm. Instead, the fairly straight up rules that you can expand uh, unless you've got, you know, the Rubo boat lift. <laughs> or excuse me, boathouse <laughs> situation. So that's that that that's you know, and so what Greg is asking for is kind of a policy debate. Mm -hmm. You know, you're upfront about it as to you know, and should I, those yeah. lines be redrawn? <laughs> that's how we would see that discussion. Right. And that's not appropriate for this particular appeal. And I can I weigh yeah. in the one thing that seems to be missing here is there's no reference to demolition and reconstruction of a dock 
I mean, specifically mentioned. When I think of expansion, I think of expanding an existing structure. I don't think of tearing down everything that's there and rebuilding. And what, you know, what, what requirements should you have to comply with if you rebuild? I mean, that's where the trade-off comes, right? I mean, and I think we need the sort of latitude to be able to, you know, make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. And I understand you're concerned about setting precedent that others might take advantage of, but th this is a rebuild. And I, I to, to be honest with you, when I read this, I didn't realize you were tearing it down. I thought, oh, well, they're just going to kind of, you know, they're going to modify it and obviously modifying, a, a rib, you know, a, a crib, rock crib pier and changing it into a, a, a you know, a pier supported by pilings it would require a complete demolition. But but a new pier would only allow a certain width, that, that is that, true, width but, this length. And so, so all they'd our... have to, the two options, I, uh, the way I understood it, the two options are, would be the same if they were trying well, to except apply for that, a new pier. Except if it's a crib, if it's a crib dock. In other words, a, um, you know, if, if it's a rock crib pier, that's different. And if that is something that, and I don't know how many rock crib piers there are in Lake Tahoe remaining, they're probably a fairly rare breed at this point. Um, but I mean, I'm just trying to to yeah. think of some way of, you know, satisfying their desires in a reasonable manner, but also doing what we need to do to to achieve some environmental gain. And I'm not sure that doing it through the appeal process is the appropriate. Uh, well. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I think <laughs> that I think we can agree. I think I agree that rock, removing the rock crib may be worth credits to something. Mm -hmm. right. But again, we're into horse trading and setting a policy that we have to we have run to, through appropriate channels, it's not on that's a That's why field, I think it's a little right? premature to be doing this. It's not to mean that we're not sympathetic, Greg. Right? Go ahead. Yeah. And so, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> yeah. I totally get your point. And, and, and yeah. I totally agree with it, by the way. I mean, it's a lousy place to create policy. This is not where you want to do it. But we're under language that exists today that may not exist after your meeting this afternoon. Well, I don't think that's applicable. I've talked to John about that. I yeah. mean, you're, you're, your per your application is in the pipeline. First of all, these new, if they're adopted by the board, don't go into um, 60, days. 60 days, right? They're not going to be implemented for 60 days. But I think that traditionally we have always, in other words, if your project is in the pipeline, it's being considered, it's being considered under the current regulations. It's not being considered under future regulations that have not yet been adopted. Mm -hmm. So Greg, I don't think you have to worry about that. I, I just, I just, think that this is better suited for a more intimate discussion at the staff level as opposed to bringing this to the board because I think the board is going to be reluctant to weigh on something that might implicate its future policies. <clears throat> yes. Just to public comment. Certainly. Open that up and, uh, okay. Yes, we will go to public comment. All right. Um, let me just uh, grab my cheat sheet here. Um, you know, dispensing the cheat sheet. Let's just go to public comment. Uh, Jan, did you have something you wanted to I, add to the conversation? Yeah, yeah. Jan Briscoe with Tahoe Lakefront Owners Association and a uh, longtime consultant. And I, with all due respect, I don't think John answered Cindy's question, first off. Um, this is a brand new ordinance. It is much more restrictive than what we used in the past, in the past 30 some years, severely ratcheted down what is a conforming peer. I mean, you to meet that test is almost impossible. You're not going to find people who want to actually go through the process and remove non-conforming peers. And while we have these discussions for many, many months and years, um, to get someone to want to remove the non-conforming aspects of their peer is a very, very difficult task. And so if your goal is which it has been stated to be, to move these structures toward compliance, then we have to have real real uh, uh, incentives and, and ways to do that. And so we're gonna say now that a boat lift is, it's always been an accessory, now it's gonna somehow be a structure. Well, that's gonna limit a lot of people wanting to come in and make improvements to get their boat lift traded out. The mooring is a mooring, whatever. If you have someone who's willing to go to the expense, which is going to be uh, hugely expensive to remove this rock crib in its entirety, you are, you know, you have to look at that as a modification. I think with these existing peers, 
uh, they're moving stuff around. They're taking a, a an L section and they're just making it straight so that now it conforms. Is that an expansion? You know, I know John would say yes, but we want to bring to you that this issue needs to be vetted. I absolutely agree. It needs to be vetted uh, with the right group. Uh, we need to come back to this because what you've done is you've set the bar so high, you will never get anyone to come through. What John failed to answer was how many people have come through under this new code to do any of these types of improvements. Nobody. Mm -hmm. This is really the first one since 2018 to even try it. And, you know, we have this real snafu with the boat lift thing. We're not happy about that. That's going to further limit people wanting to come in. If you're too deep or if you're within 20 feet of your side setback, used to be five feet. You know, all of these things, when you look at them narrowly, have changed over the time. And we had agreed to some of those changes, but certainly not to this extent. Again, we're trying to move people toward conformance. And when you take a look at this project as a modification, you're there you basically can get there. And so I think that's the policy discussion that we should be having on this one, uh, notwithstanding some of the others, but we have clients, Abby, I have people, nobody wants to come in and do this. When they realize, oh, I've got to do that and that, and that forget it. And so now, you know, I think we're missing the opportunity because once somebody spends $250,000 to replace their rod crib structure, they're not taking it out. And so we lose that opportunity. You asked about the number of rock crib tiers. Uh, it's very few anymore because under the old code, the incentives were there in the five, you know, the, the, the findings for expansion that you could make a net environmental improvement. You didn't have to meet this high, high bar that now has changed what is a conformance structure. I agree we need to take this back and have that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So just, Thank you. Just very quickly. Yes. So we have online. Any other... Do we have anyone online interested in uh if in any member of the public online would like to comment on this item, please raise your hand now in Zoom. Madam Chair, there are no hands raised up. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, John. Um I think Jan raises a good point, which is, you know, um it's it's a it's a hard fit. Well, let me let me back up. She wasn't exactly saying this. There was there was an intense balancing of interests in that 2018 plan. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you know, so I think applying you know the the rules as drafted. What they're asking for, <clears throat> even though we're getting we get a lot of benefit, is an expansion. Um, and that's the key issue for staff is are these elements expansions or is this simply a modification? And when you look at the expansion definition, um, it it meets it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an extension of uh, <clears throat> the shore zone of these. Well, that's where we go back to weighing the environmental so benefit, right? The question and that's is, a policy is there a issue? reason to take mm -hmm. to, you know, redo that weighing? Mm -hmm. Because of what Jan is saying, that mm -hmm. you know, I think she raises some good points about increases in the number of non-conforming mm -hmm. structures as a result of the new design standards. Um, and is this an example? If there's not many people that want to do this, I'm not certain it's a great example. When you're almost being too crushed, um, that you know, how many examples do we do we have of this kind of conversion, and are there ways to create standards? But what that means is a new shore zone planning process, mm -hmm. and we did take this question to the steering committee. Uh, the steering committee, uh, basically, uh, with the exception of Jan, um, wanted just to maintain the same language that we have now. Um, or the concept of what we have now. Uh, then Tiffany, we drafted uh, the expansion and modification language as uh, shown to include specific, you know, more specific examples to make it clearer what is an expansion versus a modification. That's what's on the agenda. And this is where I sharply agree. I think what we went before 
the steering committee was the narrow issue of a a buoy converted to a boat lift without any environmental benefits. That's the only thing that would be that the issue we're discussing today about very, very significant benefits and nothing could be better, I think, than my client project uh, uh, where you do this. has never been to a steering committee. It was never, if I'm right in hearing it from Jan, never discussed during the steering committee meeting leading to the board and has never been discussed by the board. So this has never had public input. Nobody has talked about this. And I'm sure you just suggest, John, that this was put to bed by the steering committee. And, and uh, I, I just agree respectfully disagree. I will disagree with that because it was one of these, at least from the 2018, that was mm -hmm. you know one of the big trade-offs and how, how we were going to try to advance short loan policy of bringing structures into conformance mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the materials for the uh, shoreline uh, steering committee, which I can distribute, mm -hmm. um, you know we think it's a fair assessment that the issue of what is an expansion um, was put to the steering committee, and there just wasn't the the interest except we can uh, to fiddle with that. And even the staff thought, I mean, when Tiffany met with these folks, the staff even thought this was a modification mm -hmm. and went through the entire process. So even the staff thought so. Well, well, I think that's in part, Greg, why these changes are being suggested to clearly differentiate between what yes. constitutes a modification, what constitutes right. an expansion. Not but just, but again, we're just looking for a solution. No, 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 right. listen, no I we appreciate that. that. And my concern is that this, this is, I think, has been a productive conversation, but I certainly don't want to repeat this at the government board. So, I mean, that's not the appropriate, in my opinion, the appropriate venue for this sort of discussion when you're talking about, you know, minutia and the details of a specific Would you, um, would you because we have the chairman of the board here, would yeah. you be willing then to pull that item on page 150, because if you adopt that 60 days from now, then we've got something. Well, I don't think, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but they have an existing project that's being processed. Would these new requirements um, be imposed upon their projects? And so they're already in the pipeline and they're already being, this, this project is being reviewed under the existing uh, code language. Um, no, but I'm not certain it makes a difference. We've already denied the application. So if we take if we take an action from the board to overturn that denial, and then we'd be right back where mm -hmm. we started. But if they, you know, if they wanted to amend their proposal to bring it into conformance, then we can process. At least process. discuss this. I mean, we've been wanting to discuss this, and I'm open to any motion or anything that will allow us to have a conversation to work out something through some avenue. I think what we did, Greg, is continue continue the appeal, not withdraw it. Just continue the appeal to give us an opportunity to discuss this in more detail. Well, and pull item uh, 150. I, I, I'm afraid, John, is right that if you adopt this, we're going to be under a whole new, new no. ball game. That, those aren't effective for 60 days. Um, but well, I'm just uh, saying the interpretation yeah. that's the, or the application that staff has already built is just reflective of that, that policy. So the question, I'm not trying to be Art difficult, method, but yeah. I'm just trying to say, you know, we've already mm -hmm. said this is not a modification and it's expansion because you're expanding the dimensional requirements of the peer. So that, and, and all this does is it clarifies that that's, Staff's position, but but and then it may, it, it may be John. I mean, I, there's no reason to go through the, the process of adopting something we have to come back and modify in the future. You know, I have yes, no the board. The board can make a decision. The board can, but you and I can't, uh, yes. and I so, can't speak for the board. The board yes. has to. No, I understand that. Cindy. Yeah. What I'm saying is that when this these code no. amendments, you you can you, you know table your appeal, right? Correct. He yes. Table his appeal. To do that if and speak to it when when this item comes up. Then right, and then you'll testify on this item and request that ninety point two, the modifications to ninety point two, as proposed in the staff report, be tabled. To hold, yeah, yeah, hold that for right. So that would not be considered during today's discussion. Of okay. these that would be your comment to us, and then the board would decide whether they should or should. Right. Yes. Yeah. 
that sounds agreeable. Okay. So it's, what are we? What do you suggest we do with the? the, the if, we, we continue the. We appeal. continue the appeal. Are you okay with right. continuing and, the appeal? And I or? hope what you're recommending would be uh, including to meet with staff and with whoever from the quarter is interested and yes and and really try to get our heads in the, uh, around this and create an intelligent policy to do these kinds of projects right, right. And and if you I, I I don't know that it to me it's not necessarily the board. It not really the is the shore zone committee, right. the steering committee, or whoever has put this complicated issue together to consider: is there a benefit to removing the, the rock crib? And what, committee, right? I don't think has, so has the proper balance. I think this is really the purview of the board. I don't know whether you agree, Jan, but I, I think there's students well, and limited utility. Greg, here. the problem is doing it, it. It's kind of awkward doing it at the board level. Now, it, does the does the third committee include a good a member of the board? I don't. No, no, it does not. But we could appoint a member of the board to serve on the steering committee. Also, you no. that? Yes, you could. Okay. Or we could just invite. Invite somebody. I hope you volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only other thing I wanted to bring up, and I appreciate Mr. Thompson's willingness to, in your presentation, you said that the uh, rocks that are were used to create the rock crib will be dispersed yeah. in a manner consistent with recommendations by right. Fish and Wildlife. We could also make that a condition of a permit. Yeah. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm so. Sorry, it was almost exactly the same in 2004. Not last project, but very similar. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the appeal will be continued. My motion. A motion to continue the appeal. All right. So moved. Okay. Um, uh, any comments on the motion? Well, and, and are you covering yes. that with removal of the agenda, consideration of the agenda item? I can't. We can't do that. That's, that's a board not decision. A, that's a board but, decision. But we're going to rec recommend to the board that they do. I mean, that's oh, I will recommend to the board. Yes, I will make the representation. I will okay. recommend to the board that, mm -hmm. as a result of this conversation, and because there are certain things that need to be resolved that weren't originally anticipated, that we will recommend uh, that uh, ninety point the modifications to. Paragraph 90.2 uh, be delayed. All right. And, and, and then uh, with the staff, we have kind of a handshake. We're going to be able to talk to you and have some back and forth. We're always open to the know you haven't been. Yeah. It's not <laughs> <laughs> gladly said something. Well, I mean, the staff, I'm sure, will do a good job of uh, interfacing with you and coming to some reasonable conclusion. Yeah. And so, yeah, Madam Chair, just Again, Julie Reagan for the record to your executive director. I I think yes, we will we will sit down and we will follow up on this. And I just really want to I want to commend everyone for being problem solvers in this matter. I want to commend Tiffany and the staff for working through a very new complicated policy. You know, it's very hard to get policy agreed to in the shore zone, in the shoreline stakeholder committee process, and then to put it on the ground. And to go in uncharted waters is challenging. So we're working through it as we go. Uh, so appreciate the good faith. And may I suggest that if we do reconvene the stakeholder committee, that we just invite uh, two representatives of the board, maybe one from each state to join that meeting and then to have that discussion. And then we can try to work this out. And then in the public comment period of the you know item 7A, you could make comment about pulling that item 90.2 out of the package. With and the and would the staff then recommend pulling that? And then, yeah, the staff would be fine with pulling item 90.2. Thank you for yes. that. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sounds like we got a plan. Okay, so we have a motion. Um, if there's no further discussion, um, I'll retain it. Well, we have a motion. You call roll, please. Catherine. Ms. Faustinos? Yes. Ms. Gustafson? Yes. Ms. Aldine? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes. Okay. All right. So we have a way forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. I think. All right. Back on the agenda. We are right on time. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fine on the agenda. But there we go. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, Okay, I've got too many cheat sheets here, so I am just going to do it. Yeah. 
committee member reports. Okay. Um, any uh, further committee member comments? All right. Seeing none. Uh, and we have, just for the record, uh, we have no, we've already, as our council has uh, indicated, there will be no closed session uh, of the legal committee today. Uh, so the only remaining item is a motion to adjourn. Public interest comments. Oh, public interest comments, of course. Uh, if any member of the public joining us online would like to comment at this time, please raise your hand in Zoom by clicking on the raise hand button at the bottom of your mm. screen or dialing star nine if you have joined by Facebook. Okay, there are no hands raised to comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Then we will close public comment. Thank you for the reminder. And uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, we have a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thumbs up. Mm. Okay, Belinda, thank you. All right, take care. A motion, all right, the uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.